Hello and welcome to episode 93 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. So sue me then, Nursing Home Arbitration Clauses, live at the National Consumer Voice Conference 2018. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia Attorneys Rob Schink and Will Smith. I'm really happy to have you guys after the coveted lunch spot because I know the last thing anybody wants to do is go to their hotel room and take a nap after eating lunch. But uh, hopefully we'll have enough time for questions and we'll also have enough time to, to maybe get out and get some coffee. So. Uh, my name is Will Smith. I'm a trial attorney from Atlanta, Georgia, and this is my uh, law partner, Rob Schink. And we have a nursing home abuse podcast. We're frequent um, visitors to the Consumer Voice Conference, and we've had uh, many of uh, the uh, individuals that you know, Richard Mollett, Robin Grant, on the podcast, and so we love coming here and getting to know you guys. I'm going to jump right into this. Um, so the objective of this is, is there anybody who's never heard of arbitration in their life, right? Most of you kind of have an idea of what it is. It's kind of a hot button issue. What are you telling? Do you hit myself in the face? Too f oh, back up. I've got a loud mouth. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. It's too loud already. It'd be too loud probably if I didn't have it up to my face. Yeah. I can barely hear my own self, and I'm constantly being told by my staff, Will, you got to take it down a notch. All right, so the objective is just to give you a 50,000-foot view. And the reason that, that we want to do this is because the vast majority of you are long-term care ombudsmen. You guys are the backbone of advocacy for the long-term care community. You really are. Because you deal with every single issue that there is. We deal with very narrow, limited issues. But it's important that you guys know this kind of stuff because you're the ones that go back to your state and you talk to your state legislature or you come, like last year, we went to the Hill after Consumer Voice and talked to our representative. It's important that you guys know this stuff so that when you go and talk to them, you can tell them, uh, which I hope you have this, this same perspective that I do, that arbitration agreements are bad, right? And so you knew we'd have a disclaimer. I'll make it real quick. None of this is, is legal advice. And I, I'm not your attorney, so if any of you go out and murder somebody after this because you're tired, uh, I'm not your attorney, all right? So the, the main thing, that we're going to look at a couple of things. What is arbitration? Does it have any benefits? What are the problems with it? What's the current CMS rule on arbitration clauses? And what rights do residents have with arbitration clauses? So in order to talk about arbitration, we have to talk about what a tort is. Does anybody know what this is? It's a tort. It is my favorite type of tort, but it's not the type of tort that we're talking about. Well, we're talking about tort reform. We're talking about personal injury law. Nursing home cases in Georgia and in the vast majority of, of the United States are medical malpractice cases against a health care facility. So in, these, in a tort, it's a civil wrong that's committed by an individual against another. So an auto accident, for example, is a tort. A doctor leaves a, a, a syringe inside you. That's a tort, right? A nursing home doesn't turn somebody so Ms. Johnson gets a stage four bed sore that turns septic and she dies. That's a tort. It's not a criminal wrong. It may involve crimes. Uh, it's not a breach of contract. And there's different kinds. There's intentional, there's privacy, negligence, products liability. You guys are probably familiar with this from watching television. Uh, and some of you have legal backgrounds, so you know. We're going to be mainly looking at negligence, which doesn't deal with intent, but a lot of times abuse can go hand in hand with negligence, and that does. So negligence. In, in a case of negligence, there is a duty that is owed to somebody, right? Um, 
there's a breach of that duty, so they failed to meet the standard, and that caused damages. The easiest way to remember it is A, B, C, D. You have to be accountable to somebody. You, you, uh, you breached that accountability, and that caused damages. Now, when it comes to duty on nursing homes, you guys, I would imagine, are intimately familiar with where these regulations come from. A lot of times they come from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. A lot of times they come from, am I getting turned down a little bit too much? Am I, I just too late. I, I, I'm a former Marine and I just, uh, I yell a lot. I'm just the way I do it. All right, so you guys are familiar with all the regulations, the F tags, for example. All the F tags are, are a list of things that the nursing home has to do. Right? The ones that we primarily deal with as attorneys, as personal injury attorneys, we deal with, you know, uh, negligence, uh, exploitation. We deal with quality of care. You guys deal with all kinds of other areas that have to do with duty. Now, these changed recently. For what reason? I don't know. I think just to confuse everybody. Um, but this is one of the one of the areas that we get our duty from. Now, we also get it from, from case law as well. So even if we didn't have the 1987 Act that gave us regulations, doctors and nurses still have to abide by a certain standard of care. So even if we didn't have those regulations, if somebody has a stage one bed sore and you're a doctor or a nurse and you go, I'm sure it'll heal it on its own, you're probably gonna commit negligence. All right. Civil monetary penalties, a lot of times um, nursing homes will, will get these. You guys probably know way more about these than I do, but this just, that's one of the ways that they get punished. Now, the way that we, in a way, punish nursing homes comes from here, the Seventh Amendment, all right? The Seventh Amendment of the federal constitution says that in any case or controversy exceeding $20, it's never been updated. I don't know if, if, if it's ever going to be updated, but it's any case at all, right? Uh, you have a right to a trial by jury, okay? And that means that you have a right to have John Cusack and Elliot Guzman, and I don't know who the rest of these people are. You have a right, it's, it's the first one I found, and later I looked at it again, and I was like, wait, that's John Cusack. That's, uh, that's but you have a right to a jury trial, right? The reason that a jury trial is important is because all of these people belong to the public, right? So there's six people, there's 12 people, and they're members of the public. They get to hear what the nursing home did. They get to go back to their, to their, uh, to their loved ones and say, did you hear about New Horizons or New Beginnings? Or they're always like New Horizon, New Beginning, right? Did you hear what they did? Ms. Johnson got a stage four bed sore and the woman died. I don't want to send my mother there. And that is a big deal to these nursing homes. And that's the reason that jury trials, one of the reasons that jury trials are so important because you get to, to um, not only have these guys decide whether or not damages are paid out, which oftentimes they are, but also these guys get to hear what happened. So, First, let me explain a, a couple of different patients, all right? Litigation is when you file a, a lawsuit, you start the process of civil litigation. Civil litigation is just, is just the procedural process by which you take to get to a jury. In real life, it takes years. I didn't learn that until after law school. Right. If you watch, if you watch television, you know, if you watch Law and Order, it's always let's arrest this guy. A week later, they're in court, you know, talking to the jury. That doesn't happen. I just had a jury trial in January that took five years to get in front of a jury. Right. So it, it takes a long time. But this is we we like litigation. Litigation is the good patient. All right. Litigation is uh, is a, is a lawsuit and it ends with a jury trial. Now, mediation and arbitration have a lot of similarities. They are both alternative dispute resolutions, right? The difference is mediation is, hey, let's try to work this out before we go to trial. 
Nothing wrong with that, okay? In every single litigation, most, most of the time, a judge is going to say, have you guys tried to mediate this yet? So mediation is not a problem. Arbitration is let's work this out instead of trial. And this is, and this looks like a young Robert De Niro here trying to get these two people to agree to something. This is mediation. Just a plaintiff and a defendant, and the mediator is like, hey guys, I, you know, Miss Johnson got a bed sore. She passed away. What can they do to make this better? And if the family says, nothing, screw you, I want six people, including John Cusack and Elliot Guzman, to hear about this so they can tell everybody back home, then that's fine. That's what you do. And, and that's the main difference between arbitration versus a jury trial. In arbitration, an arbitrator listens to both sides. All right, in a jury trial, what you're getting to is that is that jury. Is the, those people from your community. So it's wherever that nursing home is located, most likely, it's going to be six or 12 people. Now, the easiest way to explain what uh, arbitration is, is it's the people's court. Legit, that's what arbitration is. Every single one of those daytime talk shows, the people's court, um, Judge Judy, we have Judge Hatchet down in Georgia. All of those cases are literally arbitration. They're not like arbitration. They are 100% arbitration. When uh, Doug Llewellyn tells people the litigants are real, they have real cases pending in a California municipal court, and they've agreed to dismiss their court cases to have their disputes settled here in our forum, I, I've memorized that from childhood. I, I used to love uh, but um, what, what he's saying is that they have agreed to arbitration. So Judge Walker doesn't have to wear the suit. Rusty, I hate to break it to you, is not a real bailiff. I know. He, well, he, had, he was in, in a previous life. But he shouldn't have a, he, but this is the 80s, so he did have a gun. <laughs> but he shouldn't have a gun on him in this place. Because arbitration, really, a lot of times, like the plaintiff will sit over here, the defendant will sit in here in a room like this, and it'll be some guy that looks like me sitting down going, all right, so what happened? Miss Johnson, she passed away. What do you guys have to say? That's literally what it is. And it can be as fast or as slow as he wants it to, and at the end of it, he goes, all right, here's my decision. Uh, but the, the end result is, and this is what I want to keep stressing here, right? You don't have this. This is the biggest deal. Because not only do those people make a decision about what Miss Johnson's life is worth since she died of a, of a bed sore, but they know what, you know, uh, a place for mom, a new beginning, a new horizon did. When you have arbitration, it's, it's secret. Oftentimes, Probably 99% of the time, if not even 99.999% of the time, no one ever finds out what happens in arbitration. So these people don't go home and say to their neighbor at a barbecue, oh, don't put your mom in that place. It's, it's shitty. It's horrible. Right? They don't have enough staff. It's, it's terrible. Um, this is an example of what you see. It's any action, dispute, claim, or controversy. Um, Will be, will be settled by binding arbitration. What you'll hear a lot when, it, when CMS talks about this is pre-dispute binding arbitration. And what that means is that before something happens, you agree without even knowing what it is. Could be anything. Literally could be anything. The, the administrator could come in with a flamethrower and set the entire place on, on fire and it doesn't matter, you've agreed ahead of time to arbitration. Now, here's another thing that you've got to realize is that everybody in this room, and I'm including uh, the attorneys that are in here right now, we've all, we've all agreed to it. At, at some point, you've signed that cell phone contract that has arbitration in it. And I've got to tell you, even as an attorney, I don't have time to read all that. And I'm too tired, and what am I going to do anyway, right? Yeah, I gotta get my iPhone, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, but the but the end of the day, I keep going back to this. I can't remember this guy's name. Anybody remember his name? 
I, then what is this movie? Runaway Jury? Yeah. yeah, I thought so. All right. At the end of the day, what, what you're agreeing to, what is so important, is that the Constitution of the United States and every single state constitution has a clause that says you have a right to a jury trial. In Georgia, it's Article 1, Section 3, Paragraph 11. In your state, it's something. In the federal government, it's the Seventh Amendment, right? It's, it, it's set in stone. It's, it's inalienable. It's not even litigated that much. That's why it's still at $20 and hasn't been updated for over 200 years. But this is an important right, and you're giving it up. So to get to the history of this, and there is, I didn't print this off because I don't hate you know, the environment, but it's on the website of the Consumer Voice website. There's a paper on there that we've, we've written that has a more in-depth analysis of the history of the arbitration uh, in CMS. Inform yourself, go to the website, read it, or you can print it off, whatever you wanna do. Uh, but in 2003, under George Bush, um, CMS came out and, and addressed arbitration, right? Uh, and that was, their, their perspective was, look, we don't like arbitration, all right? Because the resident gives up his, his or her right to sue, and that's a big deal. However, we're going to stay out of it for now. Because we believe that the right to enter arbitration should be between the resident and the nursing home. Now, as it relates to Medicaid, we're going to let the states tackle that one. And that's been an important issue because traditionally, states don't like arbitration agreements. They really don't. Now, in 2015, um, new regulations came out. And Consumer Voice and LT Triple C. Do you guys know Nursing Home 411 with Richard Mollett? If you don't know that website, you really need to go check out Richard's website because it has a ton of, of useful information on there. But Richard's LT Triple C, the American Bar Association, the AAJ, all these consumer advocacy groups, including certain attorneys general of, of different states commented uh, to CMS on arbitration because at first CMS was just going to make them more transparent. They got 10,000 different comments. A thousand of those were directly related to arbitration and most of them said, get rid of it. Get rid of it completely, right? You guys are the ones that give money to these places. Under the Social Security Act, you have the power to prohibit them. So in September of 2016, CMS issued a final rule and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. No more arbitration agreements. If you take money from us, all right, so it doesn't apply to certain assisted living facilities. If you take Medicare, if you take Medicaid, you're not going to be able to do this. Um, they issued it and then Immediately, the um, American Healthcare Association fought back. You guys may have heard about this case. Mm -hmm. Sylvia Burwell was the attorney at, the, at the, the, um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services at the time. And so what happened with this, so, so everybody is, is very clear, right, is that the uh, healthcare industry and the American Healthcare Association are the the, uh, the Captain Planet bad guys of the long-term care. Industry. I mean, they really are, right? I can't tell you how many times I've gone to visit a, a, a loved one or a family uh, of a resident at a nursing home, and I see this on the outside of it, this sticker, and I go, all right, here we go again. But these guys sued at a preliminary injunction, right? In other words, they just sued in federal court in Mississippi. And to ask the court to stop the implementation of this rule, all right? Now, the Mississippi court allowed it, meaning that for a preliminary injunction, the basic standard is, are you likely to, to succeed on the merits? They allowed it, but it never really went up to the uh, 
the federal district. It never went up to the appeals court. But at the same time, there was another case that was going to the, um, the Supreme Court, Kendrick Nursing Homes, all right? If you hear somebody talk about that one, all that has to do is whether or not a general power of attorney is strong enough to waive a Seventh Amendment right. So the reason that I bring these, these up is that I have talked with lawmakers before, and they seem to be very confused about what these cases are. Because they'll take, tell me, well, didn't the Supreme Court already say that you can't, uh, you can ban arbitration agreements? No, they didn't say that. This was in the federal district of Mississippi, which does not make the ultimate law of America. The Supreme Court does. Thank God Mississippi does. <laughs> and hey, I'm from the South, so I you know. But this other one that was in the Supreme Court, all they said was, look, we don't hold any other inalienable rights to the same standard that you guys in Kentucky are holding um, the right to waive the Seventh Amendment, okay? So a general power of attorney is sufficient to waive for the Seventh Amendment. That's a big deal. So make sure that family members understand that. Uh, what will happen a lot of times, and I think that you guys probably see this, is the... Uh, the nursing home and the people, and look, I've worked in a nursing home for eight years. I have the most love for people who do it, but sometimes the people who work in the admissions office are, are not really that concerned about their jobs, or they're not really well trained. Um, it doesn't look like I'm offending any of you talking about this. <laughs> well, like, that's, yeah, we get it. All right. Um, but they'll have anybody sign their, their mother or father in. I can't. If, if the child could walk in with the grandmother and they'll just, here, have your grandmother, doesn't matter, just have her sign this. Medicare, Medicaid, yeah, give it to us. Um, and sometimes you'll have somebody that's like, well, I've got a power of attorney. And it was the case, and even in Georgia, that a lot of state courts are saying the Seventh Amendment is way too important. A general power of attorney is, is so you can go to Bank of America and go, hey, look, how much money does my mom have in her account? She's in a nursing home. I need to help her. That's what it, we all expected it to be. Nobody thought it would be, oh, I have the power to waive her constitutional right to a jury trial. But the Supreme Court has, has said that you do. Now, so that is a separate issue. That's the reason that I bring it up. Don't let anybody tell you, well, the Supreme Court has decided on this. Because this is not the Supreme Court. Now, what happened with this case is um, in January of 2017, Sylvia Burwell appealed it to the uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, right? And then something happened. I'm not really sure what it was, uh, but CMS all of a sudden just had a change of heart, okay? <laughs> And um, so the question is, I mean, but they did, right? I don't know if any of you were here last year, but did you see Robin give uh, a, a have a come to Jesus meeting sure. with the CMS people? Yes. Because at that time, with the new administration, you know, like it or, or, or not, and Tom Price from Georgia was then the, the head of uh, health and human services, they declined to continue uh, the appeal for arbitration, right? So where are we now? The main thing I want you to take away from this is when you're back in your home states and you're talking to lawmakers, and a lot of them, for some reason, are, you know, don't know the law um, and don't know what's happened, they may tell you things that I've heard like, well, the Supreme Court's already decided that uh, you can have arbitration agreements. Now, that's not the same thing, okay? The Supreme Court decided an issue of uh, general powers of attorney, and the other case, dead in its tracks. It never went up there. All right, so what we are, are going to probably see, though, and I, and I think this has a good chance of becoming a rule. Now, whether that rule actually gets enforced, who knows, right? Like, they're not even enforcing the rules that they have now. But there's a very good chance that this 
that this, I mean, it's true. Right? If there's a very good chance um, that this is going to develop into an actual rule, and this is good, all right? It's not the best, but at least um, the agreements have to be in plain language, which is not a huge problem now. Um, but the agreement must be explained to the resident. They must acknowledge that they understand it. Uh, they, the, it can't say anything like, well, you're not going to talk to any ombudsman or anything like that. And there's got to be a sign up that says, hey, we use arbitration agreements. So these are good things, right, in theory. Whether they actually take place in practice, I have no idea. Because like I said, what ends up happening is these people go, and you've seen these admission packages, and, and they sign them and they go, what's this? Just sign it, just sign this too. We need your Medicare and Medicaid, there you go. Whether or not they stop, they actually stop and go, hey, I want to make sure you understand something here, <laughs> that if we kill your mom, you agree that you're not going to be able to see us, right? I seriously doubt that that's going to happen. Um, so, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Excuse me. Can you go back to that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because the word that's missing that I think is really important is mandatory pre dispute arbitration. Uh -huh. I mean, the issue is that nursing homes are basically saying if you don't find this, you don't admit you. Yeah. So, and, and, and so that's a very, sign. that's a great question. So, as it stands right now, you don't have to sign an arbitration agreement, right? They can still tell you, however, they can still tell you you can't go in there. And what I have a lot of clients tell me is that they have, they've just denied signing. They, they've, they've gone in, they've gotten the agreement and said, I'm not going to sign this. And the admission person doesn't understand right. that they have the power to say, well, go somewhere else. But you're absolutely right. That's a very good point, right? So mandatory arbitration agreements, pre-dispute mandatory arbitration agreements is technically what they're called. They can't say go away. Absolutely. What I have found is they don't. All right? to, to, their, their, to their own detriment, they're not act, uh, actually exercising the power that they have. Oh, and just in case, yeah, let's, this stays in this room between us, right? It's a secret. I, no, the CMS, the, the CMS rule uh, was was struck down by the uh, by the Mississippi court. It wasn't taken up to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, but it has been. Uh, it's not being enforced, and it's going to be eradicated by a new rule. Okay. So there technically is a rule on the book from 2016 that you will not find this administration enforcing at all. So it might as well be a dead rule. Right? Like the rules that you see that say, hey, you can't tie up a horse on Thursday in, 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 in law, it doesn't do anything because it has no effect whatsoever. So the current rule is you can't have them. The current administration won't enforce it. And it's going to be taken out completely. Everybody on the same sheet of music now? All right. So I want to talk about why we're talking about these and why I don't like them. Okay? So... What nursing homes say is that it's good for the resident. Because if you remember me talking about civil litigation, right, it takes years to get to a jury trial. And more often than not, the people I'm representing don't have years and years and years, right? A lot of times they've already passed and their family wants to move on. That's understandable. So this is actually not a bad argument, right? Arbitration is typically a lot quicker. However, you've got to weigh that with the bad. Not only are the awards in arbitration up to 30% less or more, again, you don't have these people listening to it and telling other people about the nursing home. And that is the biggest issue because it's already hard enough, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir, it's already hard enough to get them to do what they're supposed to do. If they don't have the incentive of, of guys, you know, Miss Johnson passed away because she got sepsis 
from a bed sore that she shouldn't have gotten, maybe we need to hire more people, right? All they do now is, is yeah, absolutely. All they do now is factor it into the cost of business. They go, all right, well, we can have fewer CNAs and fewer charge nurses. It doesn't matter because it's going to take so long to get to, um, to a trial that most people aren't going to wait till we get to a birth, right? As a matter of fact, in Georgia, in the past, I don't know, 20 years, there have been maybe 10 or 15 jury verdicts on nursing home cases. Let me explain to you how insane that is. In 20 years, there have probably been over 10,000 auto accident verdicts, right? Why that is, I don't know, but it's already very little. If you're a nursing home and you know that if you screw up and kill Miss Johnson because you didn't have enough staff and you end up paying a million dollars, you're gonna probably say, economically, this is a bad idea. And you're gonna hire more staff, right? So it's incentive for them. The other, uh, uh, and I was talking about this with somebody recently, about what a tragedy this is, is that you have horrible things going on in nursing homes, like rape. I mean, that is, in, that is beyond comprehension why that is a problem in a nursing home. But when you have rape, you have guys like this that I don't mind posting up here, Trent Tolbert, uh, he pays himself 36000 a month at New Beginnings. I, I didn't just make that name up. <laughs> but this, this is what, this is the insanity of it, is that a guy like this is making 36000 a month. He doesn't have enough staff. They keep getting shut down and hit with, uh, with lawsuits, right? This guy doesn't need any more incentive to try to be greedy. You know what I mean? Pigs are cute, hogs get slaughtered. If, if there's no way to slaughter a hog, they just keep getting fatter. And that's what happens with guys like this. So that's why these things are important. Most of the arbitration agreements that I've read, the nursing home actually, they specify in there, we get to choose the arbitrator. Yeah. Is that normal? That is absolutely normal, and they can do that. And the reason that they're choosing the arbitrator is because it's somebody that has shown favoritism to them in the past. Um, and this is just uh, this is just a little thing that 22% uh, of Medicare beneficiaries experienced abuse. This is from 2014. The, another thing that I want you to remember is that when they when Miss Johnson gets a bed sore, she's got to go to the emergency room to have it taken care of. Who's spending money on that? CMS taxpayers, right? Um, all right. Well, do so. Another problem with the, the arbitration uh, issue, as far as that's concerned, is that um, they have repeat business with these same arbitrators. Now, what I have seen is we deal a lot with some, some rural nursing homes that may not be the most sophisticated. And it is very clear that some CEO went to LegalZoom and downloaded an agreement and put it in the admission packet. And they'll just say, uh, we, we agree to arbitration. What happens then is you have to agree to the arbitrator. But even then, the arbitrators know that their bread and butter are these nursing homes. Because you have to pay the arbitrator. That's another thing. You don't pay the judge. You don't pay the jury to listen to your case. You have to pay an arbitrator to listen to your case, to listen to evidence. And it can cost up to $500 an hour. Right? And now, now all you are thinking, well, how do I get to be an arbitrator? Right? <laughs> but $500 an hour. And there, there's no incentive necessarily for them to just quickly listen to something. right? So they're going to take their time, in my experience, look at all the evidence. They're going to shake their head and go, you know, sometimes things just happen. And it's, it's really just a shame. You know, sometimes people, they've got diabetes, they develop bed sores. They get a stage four bed sore, and, and it happens. And I don't know. I mean, I, you know, maybe thirty thousand dollars. That sound about fair? Like, no, it doesn't sound fair. And it's not fair because we make our our living off of that. It's. I would happily move to a different area of law. I, I'm not confined to this one area. It doesn't make sense because if guys like that Trent Tolbert, who is paying himself forty thousand dollars a month, driving a Porsche 
and, and, lit, and not hiring enough staff. If guys like this are not impressed now, they're never going to be impressed if they only have to pay out pennies on the dollar because they killed somebody. And that's what they've done. That's why they don't hire enough staff. And it hasn't changed since I was a CNA in the early 2000s. I worked in places, I'm telling you, the FBI should have shut them down. I was the only CNA taking care of 30 people. That's absurd. You know that you can't do that. Um, so know this, that like I said, these are contracts of adhesion. And that's what that gentleman was talking about. They're mandatory. It's take it or leave it. Um, even though they're contracts of adhesion, the, the Supreme Court lately has been favoring them. Again, there's no Supreme Court of the United States rule against CMS prohibiting this. I don't know what's going to happen this November, um, but it doesn't look like CMS is going is, is really going to be backing you guys or residents anytime soon. Okay, as it, the, the rules that were supposed to be rolled out have already been delayed, and they're probably going to continue to be delayed. So don't expect the, the um, CMS to, to fight this right now. So it's a very good chance that this healthcare industry is going to get their act together, and you're going to start seeing um, a lot more of these. But still, they don't have to sign it, right, in that... The worst case scenario is that the nursing home says, you may need to find another facility. But I rarely see that. I'll be honest with you. Most places are not that sophisticated. And most admissions directors or the, the, the guy that they've got, you know, passing out the paper doesn't even know what he's doing. Um, and arbitration agreements still have to pass, you know, state law contract defenses. Uh, like, in other words, we've got one right now where the, it's very clear that the resident didn't understand, and so contractually he didn't have he didn't have the ability to agree to this. Um, but I, but I, what I want you to take away is what arbitration is and why it's bad. The jury doesn't get to hear it because if a jury got to hear, trust me, we have cases against some really horrible places. If a jury gets to hear that. They stopped doing that. That's my belief. That's my belief why we put the Seventh Amendment in there. Because if a jury knows that this nursing home is killing people, no one's going to go there. So it doesn't make economical sense for them to pay Trent Tolbert $40,000 a month and not have enough staff. Right? This is something I'm passionate about too because I hate my former bosses. Right? Nothing would give me more pleasure <laughs> than catching them and suing them. Because yeah. you're working a 16 hour shift and you don't have enough help, and you see them come in, you know, driving their Mercedes Benz going, how's everything going? Everything's good? Okay, I'll see you later. Like, no, it's not okay. Get back here. Give me more help. So, yeah, I, our plan is to be, get more national, get more attention because we're all in this together. We've got to fight these. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.